so the question for us here always is, you know, what is geography and how does that differ from other subject areas? Uh, I've been a geographer most of my life. It speaks about places, about people, and how they interact. In many ways, it was said earlier, I am from South Africa, apartheid South Africa, where I was classified as mixed race or colored. Everyone in South Africa would know that. You may not know it, but they do. And what that meant was the geography meant a great deal. You were put in certain places away from other groups by law, by fiat. Uh, I was born, for example, near the center of town, Port Elizabeth, South Africa, uh, and then in 1950. And after three years, when new regulations and laws came into effect, our family was moved out 15 miles out of the city to the outskirts, dry, barren areas, uh, where we lived for most of our lives there. And so the idea of place and space and movement and those relationships became important to me all through my life. So it was national in effect that I would become a geographer in many ways. Geographer speaks about the where and the why. But the real important part that made me a geographer when I was in the fifth grade, and I was in a very poor school, as I said, the terminology there was non-white or colored, and this teacher though was particularly important for me, Mr. Miller, because he was able to bring the world into the classroom. And I remember one day very clearly, he brought this pod with these beans in there, brown beans, much as you can see up here. And he showed it to us, and we were astounded. He said, what are these beans? And then the story unfolded. Those were cacao beans. And from those beans, we were able to manufacture chocolate which I, as a kid, and I still do, love chocolate. And that intrigued me. It led me to a series of questions. And the first question was, where do those beans come from? They were not growing in trees in my area. It was much too dry. And the teacher explained to me, in effect, that those beans which you saw there came from West Africa, uh, from the country of Ghana. They actually went originally there, uh, as we discovered later, they were actually from Central America and ended up in Africa through colonization. But that idea of place and those events in place and those products really had a huge impact on me. And so I started asking questions about the world, trying to get some understanding as to what are places like and how do they differ. And that's what I'm hoping to project here today, that you think about that in your daily life when you see something on television Go to the atlas. I make sure I have my atlas close by the television, and I want to know where that place is, what the physical features are, what the climate, the population, the urban areas, all of those things become important to me. So Africa itself becomes a significant place where I am grounded in many ways. But what I discovered very quickly as I studied geography was that maps mean a great deal. Maps tell stories. We know that. We know as children we have treasure island maps and we look for the treasure and we see the contours of the landscape. And so maps ask us questions all the time. This is a fascinating map. And I show this to my class. And by now, of course, I'm sure in your mind's eye you've already decided what the map is about. It's about the non-metric system. And when you see it there, those are the only three countries in the world that do not use the metric system. Why? I have no idea. Uh, in the 1970s, President Ford tried to change the United States. It was thought to be a French colonial policy, uh, some importation from abroad. Uh, we will change eventually, but it'll take a while. The United States, Myanmar, and Liberia are the only three countries. Uh, 12 inches in a foot doesn't make sense at all. Imagine 12 pennies in a dime. Not going to work, okay? So maps become important. How we show various features of our world in its larger context. They force us to think about it really deeply and ask questions. This particular type of map is called a cartogram. It, in effect, shows a variable by its size, in this particular case, by country. 
and you can sh see the oil resources. Ah, I always think of this as the map of our time. For the last 100 years, this map has be de been determining geopolitics to an extent almost never seen in the world before. This is where the oil resources are in a massive extent, and you can see the power of the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, and so on. And so better understand, I would think, the power that that region has to control or influence global issues. Climographs, uh, uh, cartograms like this are important because small the United States is on there, okay? It's a really important way. So maps can speak about larger geopolitical, really serious issues, but they also have the power to amuse us and to help us thinking about our daily lives. I love this map, it's a generic map of how we refer to soft drinks. And what it does is it questions us and asks us to think about why is that so? Why do areas in the South refer to drinks as Coke? That's where Coca-Cola incidentally was based, still is in Atlanta. Um, and the blue is pop and New England, where we are a soda, mm, variable. Uh, it asks questions about ethnicity and culture, even within one country on its own. But there are other maps that, of course, are much more serious and much more important. This particular map is a map of our world. It's a map, in effect, that refers to a feature that you and I have in our pockets right now, right now. It's a map of cobalt production. And it's a map that shows where that cobalt is produced. Largely, you can see in Central Africa, Democratic Republic of the Congo, under horrible conditions, slave conditions. And yet, that cobalt is essential for your cell phone and my cell phone to operate. And so it really challenges us to think about this. Where do these features come from? Where does the cobalt get produced? How is it produced? Uh, how is it that I carry this phone around with me? I can't do without it. And yet, neglect to think of the origin of that material that in this particular case causes great hardship and really agony in a country, in this case, Democratic Republic of the Congo. So it challenges us to action, to look at this and say, we need to do something about this in whatever way we can. Maps also challenge us to think about places in a larger context. We often think of the United States as the biggest country in the world. I can say that easily because I wasn't born here, and so I can challenge the stereotypes. But the biggest country in the world in terms of size, and we all know, of course, the globe really shows the size of relationships. Anything else, a flat map, is a map projection that distorts size and shape and direction. This one I like in particular, coming from Africa. It shows the United States fitting into Africa two and a half times. And when I tell that to people, they're just amazed to see that, that spatial relationship there. Of course, maps give deep significance in history. I've deliberately included here a map of Southeast Asia, and particularly of Vietnam. It's been said many times that if there had been a greater understanding of the geography of Southeast Asia, and in particular the geography of Vietnam, that events there in the 1960s and early 70s may have turned out very differently. That a lack of understanding of the fact that this, you had this longitudinal country with two large poles, one in the north, Hanoi, one in the south, Saigon, now called Ho Chi Minh City for the most part, really attracting population and by their nature pulling this country in a way into two different regions, which still exist to a great deal. I've been to uh, Vietnam and those separations are still there. Beyond the fact that the climate itself and if there are any veterans in the audience, you know that climate, it rains. It's a tropical set of downpours that really makes life there, in many cases, very difficult. So the geography of a place becomes particularly important. For me, when I think of it locally, I try to understand political issues. It was said earlier, I'm a political activist. Uh, I, I stand out in the street corners, but I want to know what do my neighbors, what do the other areas around me, how do they see the world? And after every election, 
I am very excited to see the map, check out the map, okay? Because the map becomes important to tell me which areas, which towns in the state of Massachusetts. This is 2016 map with the election for president. And you can see here the blue and the red areas conventionally used, and the red areas largely re re Republican areas, and the blue Democrat, and to see that bifurcation within this particular state and in many other parts of the, of the country as a whole. It starts asking us some questions about regions and how they differ and why they differ. And are these differences because of economics, because of culture, because of heritage? All of these things really become important. The map is the starting point. It forces us to ask questions in, in many, many ways. Of course, <laughs> we've heard today the ideas of gerrymandering. I was in the Massachusetts State House just last week, and whenever I go there, I go up to the second floor, and I check out the, the painting of Eldridge Jerry, and he doesn't look very happy, because gerrymandering that he's given his name for is now being challenged in all sorts of ways. But this is a classical case of geography and using maps to really, in effect, challenge us to say, wow, that can't be right. Something had to have been wrong there. And we see that in the spatial arrangement of places right here. Maps also, and geography in particular, speaks about our relationship to the environment. Speaks about it in many different facets. When we see various uh, issues being raised, ask how it would be represented in a map. Because things are not evenly spread over the surface of the earth. In this particular case, these are by counties, counties that, in effect, have suffered the most through climate change and global warming and will continue to have that issue with them. And so this is an important part to bring into the conversation. How do regions vote? How is that consistent with some of the facts on, in this particular case, climate change? This one also speaks about climate change because it is the current issue of our time right now. And when you see states in terms of their own approach to the issues of climate, the issues of government's role in climate and climate change, this type of map really challenges us to think about it in a very clear way and ask, you know, how can we change this? How can we get society to come aboard and to at least mitigate some of those impacts of climate change right there? Ah, one of my favorites. I'm hungry already. Okay, uh, My old professor at Clark University, Saul Cohen, was very proud of the fact that in the 1960s, he, as a geographer, was called upon, in effect, to locate all of the stop and shop, shop, stop and shop stores in Massachusetts. And so he did all his research. He looked at demography, he looked at location, accessibility, and he was very proud. It always reminded us that almost all of the stores that he had located had been successful and lasted through those years. And so location becomes important, and geographers focus on that a great deal. And so Whole Foods does its research very clearly, looking at demography, looking at income levels, uh, looking at excess, all of these things become important. So on a local as well as a national scale, geography becomes ultimately important for us. The last thing I want to leave you with this map. Sometimes maps can become very serious. But sometimes maps elucidate and enlighten us and make our lives a little more interesting. If you've been to France or you know French people, you know there's always a greeting that can, if you're not French, be a little uncomfortable. May this map help you in terms of kissing on one cheek and the other. And so if you go to Paris, you have to do this at least four times, the southern part of the country is much less than that, but you can see the power of maps to bring this issue into the discussion to help us become fruitful, energetic people who really appreciate the world in all of its complexity. Maps, the joy of geography. Geography is an incredibly powerful subject. It's a lot of fun. It's a way of thinking about the world in a very particular way. When I watch the news, the first thing I do is I get out my atlas, both Massachusetts and a, US, uh, and a world atlas, 
and try to find out the questions. Why is it happening there? Why did these atrocities occur in this part of the world? Looking at the map, I'll ask myself the question, does this overlap with class, with ethnicity issues, with race issues? All of those can be mapped. My old uh, geography colleague, and I always like to call him Kofi Annan, who I had met a number of occasions, Secretary General of the United Nations. He'd been born in Ghana, incidentally. He was addressing a group of geographers in Washington, D.C., in fact. And he said he deals with lots of issues, the Secretary General of the United Nations, issues of border wars, uh, resources, migration, refugees. And he said when he wo he's woken up in the middle of the night, this one question and one question at first that he asked his aide, show me the maps, show me the maps. Because from the maps, he can understand better what's happening on the ground, make decisions, and try to make our world a better place. So I leave you with that notion. Maps are important. They help us. They give us joy. They give us understanding. The joy of maps is what it's all about. Thank you.